I do better without the mask. I do better taking it off sometimes than others. <clears throat> we are here in the company of one another, and especially with William, who is here to receive the great sacrament of baptism. And it brings us all to the subject of childhood, yours and mine together. And for that reason, I want to remind you of the theme at St. David's this year, that faith matters. It matters tremendously and will to William and to all of us, though we sometimes forget that, do not realize it. Faith matters because it's a part of you. It's a part of who you are, where you came from, where you may be going, and what your responsibility and my responsibility are while we're here with one another. For as, the, <clears throat> as recently said, each one of us is either on the road to heaven or to hell. It depends on how well we love each other. Well, faith does matter, and it matters where you get your faith and to whom you listen to. I probably was five years old because my older brother had started school, and he became more of an authority in my life than he had been before. And apparently we were in some turmoil, which often happened, and he came home from school and informed me that our mother had told him that I was a bad mistake. And he kept on long enough to bring me to tears, so I ran to mother and I said, Hunter said that you said I was a bad mistake. She said, I never said that to Hunter. What I said was, you were a wonderful surprise. <laughs> so I went back and told my brother what she had said, and he said, that's mother's nice way, nice way of saying you're a bad mistake. <laughs> faith matters, but it depends who's giving you what faith and to whom you listen to. Jesus knew this truth, and so as he and his company of disciples were walking toward, across Galilee, um, they came to uh, Capernaum eventually, but on the way, Jesus gave the great creedal statement that we recite again and again in all of our creeds, that he would be the Son of Man will be betrayed into human hands, killed, and in three days rise again. They did not understand the significance, at least as Mark records it, of what Jesus told them, which is understandable, perhaps, to us. And so they apparently diverted to another subject of identity, which is endlessly stimulating, which one of us is the greatest? Now, when they got to Capernaum, which is on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus said, what were you arguing about on the way? And they understandably did not want to say, I wouldn't either, not to the master. And so Jesus, as he often does, picked up on the fact that they, what they were arguing about, about who was the greatest, and so he wanted to clarify the faith to them. And he said to them, as you heard, the greatest will be the one among you who serves best. The greatest will be the one who serves and serves best. Then Jesus did a remarkable act of teaching. He performed this great act of teaching because it's, it's a symbol of something that goes to your heart, particularly as we celebrate William's baptism. He took a little child from the crowd, and in essence, he hugged him. He put his arms around him, and he said to his disciples, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. Now the question has always been in my mind, and I love to present it to people, who do you think remembers that the, the best? 
I always thought it was the child because he was in the middle of it. Maybe the disciples made some connection. Maybe you and I make some connection, but the child, I think, knew that regardless of the child's knowledge of who we proclaim Jesus Christ to be. When a grown-up presents us to other people, we remember that. When a grown-up hugs us, we remember that. It happened to the child. Well, to further this little idea, one of my favorite modern theologians is the Franciscan friar, Catholic priest Richard Rohr, who is very much in the popular vernacular of the day. He's written something that goes to the heart of this gospel for me. He says this, it must be admitted that the vast majority of Christians have made Christianity into a set of morals and rituals. It may be inevitable as we worship God through such. Moralism and ritualism allows us to think we are independently good without being of service to anyone else. And I demonstrate that. I objected to Sunday school in my youth and I got the firm answer from my parents, in this household, we go to church on Sunday. When you grow up, you can make up your own mind. So I would go to Sunday school and be good, and then go out and play with my fellow kids in the playground, thinking I had done my duty to God for the day, and I'd been of service to no one. That's Richard Rohr's point. And he continues, thus accepted Christianity often becomes a far cry from the participation we see in Jesus' life of outpouring love, of outpouring love from his heart to the heart of other people. We can act with him, however, in ways that are true and loving when we take God to heart, when we have heart that is changed by God. When we strive for actual relationship with God, we strive for actual relationship with other people, and those acts change people. Those acts really do change people. I have an illustration about that. A six-year-old boy grew up in a happy and fun-loving household, and he was a happy boy himself, enjoying the adventure of life until he entered the first grade of Venable Elementary School in Charlottesville. There were close to 40 kids in that class and one teacher. The primary method of learning to read and teaching to read was the memory method. He could not immediately remember the word that went with the flashcards when the teacher would hold up cardboard signs with letters D-O-G, C-A-T, and probably 25 other short words. Other people would raise their hands and come up with the right answer. And because probably there were so many of us in that class, our teacher had no idea where we were individually. And so we all went on to the second grade of Venable Elementary School. There, as luck would have it, we encountered Miss Deputy, who was the meanest woman I've ever met. <laughs> she was notorious in Venable School, and so we all tried to disappear, sit quietly at our desk, because we couldn't get under them, and wait for the day to end. And of course, she passed us all on to the third grade. In the third grade, we all met a new and different kind of person, our new teacher. Mrs. Hamilton was probably 26 years old when we were in the third grade. And she cared about each one of us, and she showed it in new and different ways. It probably took us all of one week to feel that the world had shifted. For instance, <clears throat> near the end of that year, she decided to call my parents with the message that it would be best for Billy if he repeated the third grade because he is a very shaky reader. 
and she wanted my parents' advice on how to proceed. So they said, let us talk to him tonight, and they did. And I remember so well when they did that, I fell apart. It was the worst news possible for me because I realized at that moment that all of my guilt and failure and sense of shame galvanized over that decision. They told Mrs. Hamilton and she said, then the trauma is not worth the delay. Let me think about it. And she called back and made an offer through my parents that if Billy is willing to give me 30 to 45 minutes after school every day, I'll try to teach him phonetics, which he has no idea about, and maybe it will work. Well, the short version is she did that, and during, it did work, and during that time, I fell in love with Mrs. Hamilton. <laughs> She wrote on the report card one day, another crisis of this young life, she wrote, Billy needs to learn not to be the class clown. <laughs> and I was crushed because I was showing off for the love of my life. <laughs> well, it did work. And from that experience, I went on with my group. And somewhere along the line in thinking about her, and I often do, I came up with my own definition of love and my own definition that seems to fit this gospel this morning of Jesus. And it is simply this, giving a part of myself to enable a part of someone else's self to come to life. Giving a part of who you are to somebody else to enable a part of that other person to find new life. That's what she did for me and it changed my life. Well, as long as I'm, I do believe that that definition, the one I came up with, applies to all of the forms that the Greeks divided love into. Agape, self-giving love. Philia, friendship. Eros, sensual love, all of the loves. Lutus and all the rest. The story does continue because I went through that school, went to high school, went to college, joined the Navy, and then decided to enter seminary. One day I learned while at seminary that Mrs. Hamilton, a young widow, had moved to Alexandria, the city, and was teaching school there. So I tracked down her phone number and I called her up and I said, Ms. Hamilton, you may not remember me. I'm Billy Wood in your third grade class. She said, I remember you. And she said, come on over and have supper with me. So I couldn't wait and went and had supper with my dear teacher. And she said, I want to show you something. She took me into her living room and there on the coffee table spread out were a whole bunch of pictures from the third grade and my picture from the third grade was there. I wish I had that, I'd look better then. <laughs> and all of us were laid out and then she showed me her scrapbook with all the, t the, all the pupils she had ever had at Venable School. And she explained, Mr. Hamilton and I never had any children. You all were my children and we were. I believe each one of us felt that because when we sent out the word we were going to have a dinner for her in Charlottesville. We got an amazing attendance of people returning from the West Coast and everywhere to celebrate Margaret Hamilton. Well, I realized as I was in seminary that I read a lot of theology and it changed my life, but I wouldn't have done that if one chapter had been different probably a whole lot of other chapters would have too. Well, you see, I believe Jesus really did have a point when he told his disciples that Christian ministry, lay or ordained, is far beyond moralism and ritualism. Those are the containers through which we worship, but not through which we live 
the life that Christ calls us to. With a child in his arms, he showed what love of the heart really looks like, really can mean. So I'm with those disciples. I think it is very stimulating to debate who's going to be the greatest. But it's even more stimulating to be involved in an act of love in which you give away a part of yourself, inconvenient perhaps, to enable another part of another person to come to life. Faith really does matter because you matter. And you matter to God. Now that faith is what really matters. Amen.